Hi, I'm Neil Thomason. I want to do a quick introduction to the Python data model. We're going to look at a few elements of this section of the Python documentation, section three, which is kind of intimidating when you first look at it. So, like, do, how many of you have actually looked at this and said, mm, too complicated, I'll do it tomorrow when I have more time? Oh, nice Cameron, yeah. Uh, it has actually got all kinds of goodies in here to make your code extremely pyth Pythonic. So I, I'm going to kind of show you a few things through a very simple kind of contrived example. Not super contrived, but I derived it from something I had done before. Um, it can look super intimidating. And Oh, by the way, I'm doing this in uh, Jupyter Notebook, um, which I've used a lot. It's a great tool um, for exploratory data analysis and things like that. It's also great to deliver tooling, like we're going to kind of talk about to people who are maybe not super programmers. Um, the, it's going to be on the GitHub, so if you are uh, want to play around with it, um, I would really urge you, if you are doing things where you're actually creating uh, most of your kind of cool part of the software as an objects, to be familiar with the section. We're going to look at a little bit of it, but it can really help you out to writing some code that's extremely Pythonic. So. Um, so what we're going to do, just to kind of illustrate a few features of this, is we're going to make uh, a little sample object, um, and we'll define a few of these methods called dunders, the underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. That's kind of a mouthful to say underscore, underscore, string, underscore, underscore, so that people call them dunder methods. <clears throat> we're going to... Uh, Define a simple object that's got a few things uh, in it that is going to illustrate it. So, uh, how many people use Jupyter Notebooks? So, a third, maybe towards a half. Uh, just the, kind of the trick here is that this is a regular web interface. It's got a kernel running in back of it, and you can see the in and outs. It can, you can do uh, documentation and markdown, but whenever you see a square bracket and I don't, it doesn't have a number in it, go, Neil, remember, you need to execute it. So what I'm doing is actually holding down, oops, yeah, it's not even rendered. Um, this object is uh, just a little contrived thing that is going to give us, we're going to be able to define a region between two arbitrary points. We're going to randomly sample uniformly a, a, a hand, number of points that are specified at object creation time and that's going to be encapsulated in this object. And we'll be able to look at it kind of in more detail. I don't want to get, give you guys, um, get you sick by going up and down so we can go back and forth on it. I'm going to uh, skip the definitions right now and actually show you um, what you can, what the doc strings will actually reveal. So inside this object, which is just going to be an arbitrary number of points between two endpoints sampled uniformly, the endpoints are inclusive. There's a handful of methods that we're gonna talk about today. I guess I don't wanna go blind, so I'm gonna try and do this with. Um, what, what do I do when somebody treats me like what would in C++ would be called a functor? Basically, they're going to take the object, here we're, this object we're talking about is called region, they're gonna make one and then they're gonna call it. What do I do there? What, ha what do I do when someone actually indexes it? When someone says, give me the second thing in this object. In it, that's every object in Python. How do you build one? Iter is super handy. And this is almost the compelling reason to actually dig into this. Because what this is going to do is allow you to leverage the Python semantic syntax and create your own semantics. So when you think about uh, iterating over a number of lines of the file, so you're like 4L in thing that knows how to iterate, iterate, you can actually do that for any object you create. With that, that's gonna allow anybody to basically iterate across it without actually understanding its composition. How do you, what do you do when somebody asks you how long you are? And what do you do when someone says, how do I, how do I print? I'm gonna actually create a little bit of a dummy object here. This is thing. As you can see, it's just a class, defines no methods, just so we can get a little bit of a comparison between the two. So here I've made 
uh, two objects, a test thing and then region. Region's going to be between 0 and 2 with three points, just to make it uh, so we can, we can look at it. Um, so by default, when you actually say, hey, thing, wh what are you? This is the default that string gives you back because print and format look to the thing that they're trying to print and go, do you have a string method defined? Uh, this is the default. Basically gives you its address and virtual memory. For ours, um, we've got, because it's kind of a complicated thing. It's not like an integer. It's not like a hello world string. It's actually got a region between 0 and 2 and a number of samples in it and a point count. So if we were to look at um, how that's done, it's just a method right here, string, when somebody asks you to display, and I built up my own thing because it's, in, it's a method in the object, so it's got full access to all the private uh, elements uh, of that object. So, arguably a little bit better, that's string. It's actually got a close cousin called wrapper, which is kind of supposed to be print the object so that it can be recreated. So that if you define that and you actually define a dunder wrapper method, when someone prints it, it's supposed to be able to save to a file and actually come back and instantiate the object. Strings just like, okay, somebody's asking to print. You know, what, what am I supposed to do here? Uh, every object that you build, it's up to them to define whether length even makes sense. Um, our particular thing, the region, actually has a number of points in it. So uh, I've defined that method so that it can answer the question. So when you look at thing, thing doesn't have, any, it has no length, it has nothing defined, it throws up its hands. Now, this is the standard len operator that basically says, hey, is there a length uh, method defined on this? And if so, I'm going to call it. Now, we're going to talk about leveraging the semantics of Python. Length is called all the time. Your objects may or may not have something that makes sense for length, but it may give the appearance of length and it not actually exist. I'm going to show you an example of that. Meaning, you may be indexing a computation as opposed to indexing memory. Um, so here's kind of one of the coolest things of this whole hassle. So here, um, someone, maybe it's you, the author, maybe it's me, maybe it's somebody that you expose this class as an API to, said, here, what you want to do is uh, you don't know any better, they don't know how it's done, they just know it's samples. So one of the things you would do by default, anytime you have something that seems like you can iterate over it, or it certainly has length, is to go ahead and iterate over it. So now, basically, without understanding the composition of this, with, and, and using a pretty simple thing here, I'll show it's how to implement it, is this is going to go across all of the samples, which are stored essentially as floats. So when print looks at a float, it's like, hey, I know how to print you, so it's, it's not that exciting. Is the trouble under enter connected to end? Is that what's going on? Is the uh, making that connection? Um, hey, I'm going to show you exactly how it's implemented, although there's some demonic possession. I guess we'll have to go back to this guy and go to the top. Apologies for this. It's actually, since it's iteration, it's a generator, um, which is right here. So this is the iter method. Anytime you use the, semant the syntax and semantics of looping or iterating over something, what it's going to always look for is a dunder iter. This is implemented as a generator, which we've had some talks about before. Super handy thing to actually understand how they work, because they give you the ability to express arbitrary complexity and completely encapsulate it and hide it from people. So what happens is in our for loop, it's like, hey, I'm supposed to iterate over you. Do you have dunder iterator? Yep, I do. So what does this do? I'm just going to go across all the samples I've already generated in a region object. I'm going to iterate across them because there are lists of objects and so it, iteration is already supported on that. In this case, they're uh, a list of samples or a list of uh, floats. Yield, this is the generator construct. What this is going to do is cough one up. 
cough one up, cough one up. And when you're out of them, automatically this construct will raise a uh, end of generation exception. I can't remember what it is right at the moment, but stop iteration. Stop iteration. I knew it. Uh, it's, the, it's the beer. Um, and so this looks, uh, this feature looks very simple. I'm going to show you an example, though, where iteration is actually computational. So this could be a huge, hairy mess that you need to do for somebody to iterate across it, but you're still going to be able to do simple constructs like this. Uh, just a, a quick check. So are, are people kind of following that? Kind of get it or used it? Okay. Okay. Uh, so here's an example of actually indexing it. So it's looking into this thing, and anything that has length, you would really presume that you can index into it. Let's see if Emacs is, something about this display is making it mad there. Well, <laughs> it's actually not Emacs either. <laughs> but I digress. Uh, I knew you were going to say that, Cameron. That's why I had this here. So here's how this works. So when you basically go in and use the syntax of Python, open square bracket, something to index off of, and it can actually be pretty general. It has to be hashable, but typically it's going to be a integer. It's going to look into the thing. Thing, square bracket, index. It's going to use those semantics, and it's going to look for this method. So anytime somebody has a region object and they're going to index it, either by individually or basically um, implied through some kind of looping mechanism, it's going to come down and say, is this a valid index? It's going to look for it if it's below zero or if it's greater than the count, and it's basically going to return the sample. All right, five minutes. You actually get more time if you ignore Calvin, but... Uh, <laughs> which is just a good principle in general, but that's just me. Uh, so there it is. If we basically try to index past the length, it says, okay, fine, you're out of bounds. We I define that message. Here's an example of basically using that notion of indexing, but actually providing a, uh, pr providing a computation. Here's a simple function, power of two. Basically, you give me an index, I'm going to give you a power of two back. Here, I'm going to... Um, Call, I'm going to make one of those objects and then print a handful of them. Uh, so you see that P2 is the object from power two that I made, and I indexed it with one, two to the first is one, two to the second, or two to the third is eight. Prints them all out across there. So you can actually do things that are fairly complicated and using the semantics of, um, of uh, indexing to make some kind of cool things. Um, this is, I don't think, super cool because it's actually kind of confusing. Um, this is the dunder call method, which basically says, hey, I'm giving you the instance of an object, calling it like a function, what should I do? I said, you can go across all the things. But kind of just to bring this in for a landing, it's, okay, fine, so what? Why, why is that cool? So here is an example of, um, I am going to define a very simple function called mean. It's going to uh, use the sum function which expects things to be iterable in length, as we've talked about, it's like, hey, if you're a composite object, tell me how long you are so I can do something meaningful. So in here, we're going to do exactly what we talked about before. This is a list of integers. Lists are iterable. It just coughs these things up. You get a sum. Basically, it's six. You divide it by the length. The three, it's two. Now, wouldn't it be kind of awesome to hand somebody who's like been like, why can't I load 10 million rows in Excel? Um, and uh, basically do something like this. Here I'm going to make a new region object from zero to one. I'm going to make 400 points. I'm going to call the mean on it. So I can expose through my API objects of my construction, hide it, and functions that manipulate them that basically will allow them to use standard Python things. And when I say standard Python things, I mean stuff like uh, this is going to be a uh, matplotlib, plot, mat plot uh, basically a, just a quick line uh, chart, but it doesn't know uh, anything 
about what this region object is that we defined at the beginning of this talk. Yet it expects to be able to iterate it across it and it expects to get a value and it, it's like, that's what I do, dude, so I can definitely plot this. So you can see right there, showing a handful of things, you can take this set of tooling, give it to somebody, and with a little bit of instruction, either make them, give them an exoskeleton or give them a lot of capability to blow all their fingers clean off their hands. But anyways, I've used this a lot and it's, uh, it's, it's a great thing. Just to kind of wrap it up, I really think it's worth investing the time. It gets easier as you go through it. All of the kind of under the hood things are actually explained in section three. It may take you a time or two through it, but you can create this kind of stuff. You can make a REPL and just kick around the ideas till you get it right. I would recommend doing that at least a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat, but there's a great book, Fluid Python, um, which kind of talks about this. But it's not a cheap book, but uh, if you spend some time going through section three and then get something like this, your code will be extremely Pythonic and your future self in three months will really appreciate it and the people doing maintenance will love you for it. So that's it. Uh, should I do any questions or you want? You've got like a minute. Take a question or two. <laughs> any questions? Apparently not. <laughs> I mean, it, it, uh, I'm trying to think, is it, uh, does it return none once the, you raise the exception or actually never gets to it? So it, it considered it to be fine, but it may be exactly right. Your test coverage would have shown you that. Well, when you do real-time coding for presentations, <laughs> well, just JIT coding, you yeah. know. Section three, super powerful thing. There's all kinds of things. Anything that's under the covers, that like sequences, mappings, all of that stuff is explained here. So this is, you know, you're kind of like dictionaries are the, you know, that's the thing that makes Python work. Everybody's got a dictionary. That's a call one. But uh, the stuff we're talking about is basically for um, class instances, and there's a whole ton of them. I mean, you can override arithmetic operators. So you can actually have multiplication and you can actually change, you can have defined both of them to actually do left and right associative. It's super cool, well worth kind of looking through. Um, they're all in section three. Any other questions? One more, one more quick question. Anybody? All right, let's give Neil a big round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.